the first time I saw Bernard and met Bernard, see, he, he was 18 and he'd been there since he was three years old. Uh, and he would come to building six. He lived I, in another building at the time, but after he got off of his shift, uh, he had to push a broom over in the administration building. He would come to our building because he had relationships with the, some of the uh, inmates there, as well as some of the employees. And he would go to the break room. There he would give a stand-up comedy performance, actually. He would have them in stitches because he's funny. And he's obviously brilliant. So, uh, so you know, he not only... A, is smart, but he has uh, a moral compass that's beyond anybody I've ever known. And we were uh, um, like brothers. Uh, I sure I would take him out of Willowbrook for a weekend. There, there were many people that were going home with employees. That's a, that's a good thing, you know. Anytime you can get out, that was good. And he would just hang out in my apartment. He saw some uh, tapes audio tapes and it, uh, because I, I was a, a political activist in, in the 60s and 70s. And uh, so they were Dr. Martin Luther King and Malcolm X tapes of their speeches, uh, which I listened to and which Bernard then listened to. And he would then quote them back to me <laughs> and uh, they made a lot of sense to him. And he just was a, a he spent a lot of time listening to those tapes. He just has, had a hunger for justice. It was mutual because I learned a lot about Willowbrook from him. And he learned a lot about organizing from me. And uh, he used, he's used that information. I was interrogated by the administration of Willowbrook. They want to know who's my work and a communist. Or did you have sex with my work? They needed to find something so they could legally fire my work. And I, I wouldn't give them any information at all. Bill Frost and I quickly observed the most progressive element in that institution was the parents. They were coming to visit mostly on Sunday afternoons. Bill and I started having a weenie roast outside of the of our, each of our buildings and uh, we would bring uh, somebody that had expertise in the and uh, the development of people with intellectual disabilities, such as teachers, you know, physical therapists, occupational therapists, uh, speech therapists. Out of those uh, weenie roasts uh, uh, grew the parent organizations. They wanted to move forward to uh, get, uh, get better services. And we all educated ourselves of and we all came to the conclusion that institutions were not capable of providing these services, that uh, the most fundamental thing was the family unit, uh, and that um, that was where the love and uh, formative uh, interactions with other humans could, could occur. We took them to the back rooms of, well, of where their kids were staying, which they had been forbidden to enter in the past. I mean, I can't imagine how ridiculous that is. But uh, on those Sunday afternoons, we escorted them back and um, they were appalled as they should have been. I mean, why, why would you continue to allow people to share a bath, bathrooms with no doors on the stalls when you know 100% of them get hepatitis within six months of entering. And, and when the incidence of uh, intestinal parasites and worms was incredibly high, what, why don't you do something? You know, just no change was even imagined. And so um, it 
it was uh, our our organization quickly got bigger and they got angry. The parents got involved. They got organized. They got confident uh, because their meetings were really big. We had a meeting of um, one Sunday uh, with a large group of parents, uh, a large room full, and the director, Dr. Jack Hammond, was invited. He was asked to take a public stand against the conditions where there weren't enough clothes, there wasn't enough staff. It was uh, one attendant uh, for 70 people on a day room. Uh, He refused. He said, I've been in this business for a long time and it won't work. They ejected him from the meeting at that point. Um, And the that was a Sunday, and that following Monday, there was a memorandum uh, circulated through the institution saying that no employee was allowed to attend a meeting of the parents' organization. But the next Sunday, Elizabeth and I did attend, and so did, I'm sure so did Bill. Um, and then we were promptly uh, given our pink slips. Um, and, but unfortunately, uh, when the supervisor in my building uh, handed me my pink slip, he forgot to take my key. That gave me <laughs> the opportunity to uh, enter the place illegally <laughs> with the film crews. Um, it took me a while to grasp that this was um, something that people were really paying attention to. We'd been so used to being ignored at Willowbrook. Uh, that I just, I, I really didn't know how it would be greeted. Gradually, I realized that this was a, a groundbreaking event. One time when he was uh, doing self-advocacy work, he sponsored a, a uh, an event. It was Hunter College, now <laughs> I'm thinking about it. Um, it was educational for people with disabilities of all kinds. And they would talk about all kinds of liberating things by people who had had to go through this uh, you know, system. And it was, I've bragged about it so many times. And that was the kind of work that Bernard did. He, that he organized that. Uh, <laughs> so talk about being proud. I mean, I'm beyond proud. I'm just amazed. He knows how to organize people, and and he's better at it than anybody I've ever known. <laughs> so uh, I'm I'm I, I'm honored to be talking with him because his his moral compass persists. And so I had five children, and he get of all the people I ever wanted them to be around, it was Bernard the most because he gives such good advice, and people freaking listen to him. <laughs> you know so. All right, that's, I'll stop, but I think he's pretty amazing. People who work with people with disabilities need to be reminded that we're working on real human lives and not animals. I remember one of the things I never told about because I keep blocking it out of my mind. When I used to give out cookies and candy, I used to throw it on the floor and they all get down and grab it. I mean, and I never, I never told about that, and this, that happened. It happened. It happened. A moral lesson, you know, to do unto others is as you would have them do unto you, and to recognize what, whether people have a disability or are different from you in a lot of ways, or maybe one way. That doesn't matter. They're a human being and they're equal in value. That's uh, hopefully what we did was a big lesson in that. And not talk down like they're a two year old. That helped 
I, I know when I go out to eat, the way that a waitress asks, what does he want? And I ask, hello, I'm right here. <laughs> you can talk to me. And they get so embarrassed. I don't care. It, it, it triggers a lot of uh, insights. And uh, so what you're doing is has been um, a, a very positive thing for, for me and, and I think for the, the country. And I hope that you succeed in, in uh, creating a better life uh, for everyone and, and creating conditions uh, under which they can enjoy a better life. It's something that um, is an ongoing process. <clears throat> uh, and so I, I, I think that the work you guys are doing is uh, foundational and um, may you continue doing it, all of you. You left a big important thing out. I used to stop the left with his cooking. <laughs> he, yeah, he's, he, he would say, I'm a meditarian. <laughs> I, had to, I had to make him go out and get food cooked. Cooked. <laughs>